Good morning from rainy Liverpool, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Richard Granin and Friends. I'm joined here today by Mr. Mark Vicente. Um, Mark, I would introduce you as a filmmaker. Yeah. Is that how you introduce yourself? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. That's There's a lot mission. of other things as well, but filmmaker is basically... There's a lot you do. There's a lot I do, yeah. yeah. So currently you have a podcast, you have several films that you're working on. Yes. Um, and that's the main thrust of what you're doing. At the moment, yeah. At the moment, yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Where were you born? Yeah, so I was born in South Africa mm. way back in 1965. So I'm an old fart now. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, traveled the world a lot because I, you know, I went to boarding schools. My parents moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I later kind of figured out that, that, that both my parents were in intelligence. So they were always moving from place to place. Yeah. Um, when you say an intelligence, you mean South African intelligence? South African intelligence, yeah. So, you know, we lived in, um, you know, South Africa, obviously, uh, Brazil, mm -hmm. Canada, uh, Portugal, the US. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of early on, I, you know, I lived in the bush with my grandparents for a while as well, in the middle of nowhere, which is what amazing. Age, what age were you when you were doing that? From the age of about four to maybe even three to six, I was, I was with them. Yeah. Um, there were lots of divorces in my family and all kinds of craziness going on. Yeah. And um, then I went to boarding school when I was very young. Mm -hmm. I started when I was like uh, six and a half or something. Yeah. Which was quite an experience. It was very British boarding school. Quite right. Way north in, 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 in what was then the Transvaal, which is like close to what was then Rhodesia, mm -hmm. which is now Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a boarding school life, you know, for a lot of my life. And then at a certain point, I became obsessed with the idea of filmmaking. How long were you in boarding school for? Altogether, it was seven, just over seven years. So, yeah, quite a while. Quite a while. When did you start thinking about films? When did you fall in love with films? So, I think it's when I saw Star Wars. Okay, because I had this, I had this, this compulsion because South Africa was very fucked up. Mm. You know, apartheid. It just everything was just a mess, and I knew it was a mess. Mm. And the religion of my my grandfather didn't have any answers. Right. You know, and also it was weird because in that culture, they looked in the Bible and said, like, the Bible says that black people are lesser and stuff like that. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Mm. That's not what the Bible's saying, you know? Mm -hmm. um, what was his, what was his uh, denomination? It was Dutch reform. Okay. Which mm -hmm. is, I guess, what is Dutch reform? It's anti-joy. It's, it, yes, it's anti-joy. <laughs> is it Protestant? Is that what it is? It is. It is Protestant, yeah. But it's, just, but it's hardcore. Oh, it's I've very strict. I've done a, a podcast with a, a Dutch guy and he's like, there's, there's this real thread of, um, it's not what people think of when they think of the Dutch, yeah. uh, but an anti-pleasure ethic. Yes. Like pleasure itself yes. is a dangerous, yes. corrupting influence. Yeah. Even though we would think of them as being, you know, quite cool and yeah. smoking yeah. pot no, 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 and no. all that. Very strict. I mean, my, my people on my mother's side, you know, were, were farmers, mm. you know, people of the land mm. and they'd gone through terrible hardship, you know, mm. and during the, the, the war and different things, you know, the, the Afrikaners were put in concentration camps. So they came out like tough, Yeah, you know, um, traumatized, very traumatized. Mm. But I think it was around, um, the age of 13. And actually I was in Lisbon with my parents mm. and, and they took me to see, I guess it was called Guerra de Estrelas or something, Star Wars. Yeah. And I- Guerra de Estrelas. Guerra de Estrelas. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't know what it was, but I, I remember watching it and I, I, I was so blown away. What I do remember is walking out in the lobby and I was like consumed with this film. And my mother started talking. I said, no, 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 shush, 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 shush. Because I was having a moment of some kind. Processing. You know? I was processing. And what I, I think what happened is that I'd had this feeling of like, I want to change the world. You know, I, I, I want people to feel a certain way and mm. I didn't know how to do it. Star Wars is 1978. You was it? Yeah. 78, and you're, yeah. you're 18 years old. No, then I would have been 13. Oh, 13. I was so, 19, yeah, 13. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's, oh yeah, of course my math yeah. is bad. Um, yeah. And that's, that's the year I was born. What do you think makes Star Wars uh, such a special film? I think it's the... There were a couple of things, but I didn't understand at that point but about the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. You know, that was one thing. Because mm -hmm. I found out later that George Lucas, you know, who directed it and wrote it, mm -hmm. you know, studied a lot of Joseph Campbell's work. Mm -hmm. But I think it was this idea of the force, mm -hmm. that there was this something that was unseen. And the, the thing was, it wasn't about religion. Mm -hmm. 
because as a kid, I'd had all these experiences that I couldn't explain. And the church certainly thought they were not real or they were satanic. Mm. So now I'm watching a movie that's talking about the force and all these things. But also like I had this sort of, I was a kid still. I imagined like superpowers and moving shit with your mind and stuff. Mm. That was exciting. Yeah. Lucas was clever. Yes. You know, he made something that was very exciting and there was all this sort of hidden stuff, not even hidden, just in there, mm. imp implicitly in there. And, and the, the idea of the force, that there was something big and profound beyond us was like, it was like crack to me. I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. But the, the thing that was so profound for me besides that is because I felt the impact it had on me mm. and I was realizing like, oh, so movies, like that's how you get your thoughts out. That's how you get your feelings and your message out mm -hmm. to people. You make movies. So mm -hmm. that, that was my obsession then from 13 on. I remember one of my earliest childhood memories uh, in Bebbington, I would have been four or five years old and somebody saying to me, oh, this is a figure of uh, like these little figures that people had of Boba Fett, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia. And I was playing with them and they were saying, oh, this is Star Wars, this is Star Wars. And I don't even know, I don't know what that is. And this older kid who was like 18, he was like, have you not seen Star Wars? I went, no, I don't know, I don't know what you're on about. Oh, it's an amazing film, you've got to see it. Yeah. And it was like, um, it was like being proselytized to, you've got to convert yeah. to Star Wars. They recorded an old VHS for me, took it home, watched it. And uh, yeah, I was like, yeah. was, for a kid, it was like, this same is cool. feeling, right? Yeah. Incredible. It, it is kind of a religion now, unfortunately. I mean, people, the Star Wars people are going to be upset at me, but <clears throat> there are people now that this is their life. You know, they go to every convention, they dress up and I, and it's like, wow, it's kind of hardcore. I mean, I went to, when I, when I, um, a few years after I, I met my wife, because she was in Star Wars. You should explain that. Yeah, yeah. So you, you so, actually have a, a real life Star, uh, professional Star Wars connection. No, it's insane. So what happened was that a friend of mine knew that I was a Star Wars fanatic. Mm. And she said, oh, I have a friend. You should meet her. Mm. She's in Star Wars. And which Star Wars was she in? She was in, um, oh my God, what was it? It's not a new hope. It's, it's not the, not the very first one. It was the next two. No, no, sorry. So not the, it was the fourth and the fifth, not in order of the, you know, the story, of but the in canon. order of shooting. Yes, yes. Yeah. It was the, the, the fourth and the fifth. Um, and she played Baru White Sun, mm. who was the aunt that raises uh, Luke Skywalker. Yes. Like in the very first movie, you see them, you know, burnt to death. You see them killed. Because yeah. the stormtroopers come and kill them. So mm. I was like, oh, that, that'd be great. And so... Um, her name is Bonnie Peace. And mm. so I met her mm. and then I found out that she was a fan of mine because I made a film called What the Bleep Do We Know? And she was a huge fan of What the Bleep Do We Know? Have you all seen What the Bleep Do We Know? Yeah, it's should, a strange uh, film. Check it out on uh, on YouTube. Yeah, it's it's very dated now, but you know, back then it was like a, a big deal. Well, it was mind blowing and it was the yeah. same effect as Star Wars. Yes. What the Bleep Do We Know? At the way the way I found that was the same way as I found Star Wars. A mate of mine was like, have you seen What the Bleep? I was like, what, what are you on about? What kind yeah. of a title is that? Yeah. And he gave me uh, a DVD and was like, sit down, yeah. I will make you a coffee and watch this now. And then pinned my eyes open, clockwork orange style yeah. and forced me to watch it. Yeah. Um, in 2004, if you were into new age and personal development, you couldn't get away from it. No. And it was mind blowing yeah. at that time. I mean, it at was- the time, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So she was a huge fan of that. And so we um, sort of connected and, you know, we stayed friends for a number of years and then, you know, a few years later, mm. you know, sort of became romantically involved. But yeah, so just to fast forward, my wife said to me one day, this was a few years later, like I have a, a sci-fi Star Wars convention in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to come? I'm like, fuck yeah, let's do it. You know, mm -hmm. so we went to this convention and it was very strange because I'd never been to a, a, a convention before. Mm -hmm. So she walks in and she gets handled by security. And the next thing they drag her away and there's Darth Vader and her, and then all these stormtroopers around her, and they start marching into this massive auditorium. Mm. And I'm just back there thinking, okay, I'm chopped liver, whatever, I'll just watch. <laughs> it was so weird. Mm. And the music plays, and they're sort of marching her in. And I was like, they do the this Imperial is, March. The Imperial in. March. It I was insane. Yeah. And then I walked in this auditorium and I saw, like, you know, all these fans. I'm like, my God, mm. this is intense. Now, I think that it, it as a kid, as a 13 year old kid, if that was available to me, I would have totally done all that. Yeah. You know, all of it. Yeah. And then, and then more recently she was in the, the, um, series Obi-Wan Kenobi mm -hmm. because they brought her character back and, and, um, Joel Rose. Edgerton's character back as well. And we went to the, the big premiere in, in Anaheim and it was, it was 
unbelievable. I mean, we walked into an auditorium and again, you know, they march everybody in and, you know, sit them down in a certain place. And there was like, I think about 7,000 people. And all you saw were just lightsabers, you know, waving. It was insane. Kind of sounds like a cult, Mark. It does sound like a cult. <laughs> Some of it sometimes is a bit like that. So, um, so like if you say anything bad about Star Wars folklore, yeah, you will be dealt with. <laughs> You're in the out group. <laughs> yeah. Um, just back to the film itself, what you said, there's the, there's the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. um, the world building was pretty good compared to other movies. There were, I don't yeah. really think of a movie before that no. where that crazy guy built a whole yeah. world for his characters to operate in. And the thing is, it felt real because the way he saw space was not futuristic and gleaming. It was dirty. Mm. It was like so far in the future that there was old technology that was being used. Mm. So it was this sort of Western feel, like mm. a cowboy movie mm. with like the Buck Rogers vibe yep. all put together. And there was something about it that was so tactile and real, like there was dirt on everything yeah. and there was aging on everything. Yeah. So I think for me, I, I watched something that felt so real. Mm. You know, it wasn't, um, you know, the old Battlestar Galactic and the old Buck Rogers and there was, everything was just too new. Yeah. And you could kind of feel that it was shot in the studio. Yes. It felt like, especially in the first movie, this was a real place. Yes. These were real places. You yeah. Know? And the other thing, weirdly, that still stuck with me for so long is remember, uh, uh, those of you that have seen it on Tatooine, the, the two sons, mm -hmm. when, when Luke is standing there, those two yeah. sons, there was something about that, you know, because I yearned for, I suppose as a kid, I was, because of South Africa and how difficult it was, I was yearning for another kind of world. The, two, the two sons was always something that impacted me right in the unconscious. Mm. Like I was looking at something I'd seen before in another life. Exactly. That's how it felt. And the moon as Death Star mm. was really compelling for me. I was like, because yeah. I was always looking at the moon as a kid and I was like, that's, what is that? And yeah. it's exactly the right size and shape that if there's an eclipse, it just perfectly eclipses. Come on, that's right? been built by right? someone. <laughs> it's like the moon was positioned <laughs> yeah. very well. Yeah, yeah, really, really it's well. Odd. It it tickles the unconscious. I think the whole, yeah. uh, certainly, the first three Star Wars movies, right up to when the Ewoks arrive. Um, I think it's great. Yeah. If you can yeah. stop it, where well, Return of the Jedi, <clears throat> where they rescue Han Solo. Yeah. They blow up Jabba the Hutt's palace and they fly away. Yeah. That's the end of the movie. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just stop there. No, exactly. It's perfect. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, for me, uh, the favorite one is the first half of Return of the Jedi. I was obsessed oh. with the fact that it, it's shot in Tunisia, I think. It all takes place in the desert. Yeah. You said sometimes it's like a Western and sometimes it's almost got like a Lawrence of Arabia feel to it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. even the character of Obi-Wan who lives out in the desert yeah. and yeah. is this old ninja with a with yeah. samurai sword. It's, yeah. it's so cool. Do you know the, the, the Lars homestead in Tunisia is still there? Oh, really? It's become a tourist attraction now. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, for, for the last, for Obi-Wan Kenobi, they rebuilt it in Los Angeles um, in a, I suppose I can say it now because it's, yeah, it's out now. So mm. in, a, in a mine quarry mm. in like kind of the middle of the city, Oh, there was an old quarry. Yeah. Um, and they, they, they used that and then, you know, a bunch of blue screen all the way around and mm. they sort of redid Tunisia, mm. you know, there. And actually yeah. worked pretty well. Yes. Yeah. There is a, the only cinematic experience I'd say that I would compare to that, that I would, obviously I, I'll, I'll never, I'll never direct, but when I am jealous of directors and mm -hmm. I think, fuck, I wish I'd done that. Mm -hmm. Star Wars comes to mind and mm -hmm. um, uh, Peter Jackson's efforts with Lord of the Rings yeah, because of the world building. Yeah. Because if you're a director, you're a storyteller, I want to enter your story completely. Yeah. I want to be on that journey. Yeah. And so few movies do that. Very few. But with uh, Star Wars and with Lord of the Rings, uh, are you, do you like Lord of the Rings as a movie? I do. I do like it. Mm. I'm not as much of a fan as some people. Yeah. Like I'm a big fan also of like Alien, Ridley Scott's wor you know, oh, world. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. that is serious world building. Yes. I, 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 yes. Ridley Scott. Yeah. You've got Alien and Blade Runner. Oh. For world building, it's... I've seen Blade Runner more than any other movie in history. It's uh, Really? Yeah. I I used to do the Rutger Hauer speech, you know, from the end. Yes. The time to die speech. Lost like tears all in those, the rain. Yeah. All those moments we lost like tears in rain. Yeah. He starts with, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Yes. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I've seen sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. Mm. All these moments will be lost in time like tears in the rain. Time to die. Yeah. So I memorized this damn thing. Yeah, yeah. So then many years later, I'm in LA. 
I've just shot the movie Serafina with Whoopi Goldberg. I'm in LA. She calls me and says, hey, come over for dinner. I have somebody I want you to meet. And I walk into this really high-end restaurant and she's sitting with Rutger Hauer. I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> and I sit down and I'm like, I can barely speak. Yeah. And he's just a normal human being. Of course. And I'm just like, oh, it's you. <laughs> the replicant is here. <laughs> it's you. And I said, you know, I memorized that speech and he goes, yeah. I'm like, oh, I thought you'd be more excited. <laughs> Is it, I don't know if it's a folklore or if it's actually true that he, he wrote that or he improvised it. I don't know. I or don't. it's a last minute script change it or something have like been. that. It yeah. might have been, yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's beautifully delivered. Oh my God. It's such a beautiful peak uh, to yeah. the film. Like yeah. It really no, it's be- the film I, I love, you know, I'm, I'm a huge sci-fi fan like you. Mm. I love living in those worlds mm-hmm. and I love it because you can address things and talk about things that you can't in normal drama. Yes. You know, I, I, as I've loved, I watched all Star Treks, every mm-hmm. episode, every everything, because mm-hmm. you can talk about like deep, deep issues, Yeah, you know, and it's acceptable because yes. it's a metaphor yes. that's removed. You can talk about the abuse of religion. You can talk about racism. You can talk about this. You can talk about that. Yeah. You can talk about existential crisis and isolation and mm-hmm. like, what is, who are you? And, you know, do you even exist? And mm-hmm. blah, 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 you know, all that stuff. And it, it gave me this freedom as a kid to explore these ideas. So mm. sci-fi is, it's probably my favorite genre. It's sci-fi and then it's action. I, I uh, with Star Trek, um, I really liked the old one because in Portugal in the eighties, they would, they only had the budget to buy like older series. Oh, yeah. So I was raised on stuff that people have been watching the fifties in America, yeah. like the Twilight Zone, yeah. uh, the Rifleman um, yeah. and Star Trek, but the old Star Trek. And it, obviously you watch it now and it's camp and it's sure. hokey and sure. whatever. Yeah. But it was like every season was like a philosophical exploration of something. Yeah. With a, it, I like it because it's good natured. Yeah. It's it's actually, yeah. um, I don't know, like people take the piss out of, uh, what's, what's the actor who plays uh, Captain Kirk? Uh, uh, fuck. How am I blanking right now? Because I've, I've put you on the spot. That's why. I can't think of it. It's the, in my head. The, I met him. And the dynamic he has with uh, yeah. with Leonard Nimoy. Well, apparently, they yeah. didn't really like each other very much. Didn't they? Didn't they? Appa- apparently not. Uh, they weren't like uh, really, really close friends. But and um, he was always very buff, and there were always very beautiful women around him all mm, the time. Mm. William Shatner. Thank you, William Shatner. How, How did, did I we not blank know on that? that? <laughs> My God, I was picturing him. Yeah, he actually came to a screening of What the Bleep. You know, when oh, we were he? first doing like t- test screenings, he came. Oh, awesome! It was cool. Yeah, it was really. He loved it. I've had like. There's stories from stand-up, he apparently likes stand-up comedy and I'm big in stand-up comedy as well. And like, he'll go and chat to stand-up. It's always positive. It's always yeah. like, he's, he's a nice yeah. guy. He's very supportive. And yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there's a lot of, what the bleep in a sense is an exploration of the force. It is, yeah. You know, it was this weird attempt to unify a whole bunch of things. Um, Cause we were talking about, you know, neurobiology and, you know, biology and quantum mechanics and, really exploring the idea that reality is not what you think it is. Right. It's much more malleable and we have a lot to do with it. I think we, we really stretch things a lot. You know, a lot of people call it pseudoscience. Call I would, it the quantum physics. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree. I would agree. There was actually, um, there was actually a, um, a, a physicist mm. at Columbia University mm. that we got on camera, David Albert. Mm-hmm. Young guy at that time. Mm. And David Albert felt very tricked, you know, oh. because we, he felt that we used his stuff in a certain way. So we had this big symposium mm. in Santa Monica one day and David Albert was invited and mm. he came up to me and said, I'm very angry at you. And I go, okay. <laughs> and he says, you've really, you've really twisted my words. Mm. And, I, and I thought about it and I thought, okay, mm. okay. So tell me the truth. Mm. And he said, cause I thought he was going to say it's all hogwash that you've done. Mm. And he said, the problem is you've simplified it. Yeah. It's so much more mysterious than you've presented it. Yeah. It's way more mysterious and way more interesting. Yeah. And you've sort of turned it into this spiritual new agey thing. Well, it had to f- it fit into an ideological reality it, tunnel. It did, yeah. yeah. And and he said to me, that's what I'm angry at. And I said, okay, when you go up and it's your turn, mm. say that. And mm. he's like, really? I go, yeah, say yeah. that. Yeah. I thought it was great, you know? And, and yeah. it really struck me because as I... You know, after making the film, as I studied more and more, mm. um, I realized, yeah, we, we did a very simplified version of what it is. And we conveniently said, this means that. 
because yeah. of the double slit experiment, therefore it means you can change things with your mind. Well, that, that was, um, that was actually my favorite part. Um, because I remember it, everybody said that in the new age movement at the time, Deepak Chopra said that mm -hmm. in his book, Synchro Destiny. Mm -hmm. And it's just a misunderstanding of a scientific term, which is observer. Yeah. So we all went, oh, there's an observer effect. That means a human observer. And, yeah. and in physics, an observer is a, is a tool, is a piece of equipment. Yeah. And it's actually a piece of equipment. Yeah. It's not a person. Yeah. No, it's not a person at all. It's a sensor. <laughs> it's a sensor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Not a tool, a sensor. Yeah. And we all made that, which you, people make the same mistakes in psychology. They hear a word that in normal usage means this. And, yeah. and everybody just ran with the ball like, oh, if you it's, think it's differently, true. it changes reality. It's true. But, but at the same time, you know, because if we do a test here and you say to me, Mark, lift the glass with your mind, I can't do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But then there are these weird things that happen. Yeah. You know, like you haven't seen somebody for a long, long time. Mm. You think about them obsessively suddenly mm. and you bump into them. Yeah. And you go, okay, how? Yeah. Is it possible that I saw them out of the corner of my eye? I didn't realize it. Mm. You know, um, is there something, was there a glitch in my mind? Was like a weird deja vu thing, a loopy thing that happened? Mm that I did see them, didn't, didn't see them consciously. A loopy thing happened where I thought a whole 24 hours went by and now I bump into them. I have no idea, but reality does feel a bit glitchy sometimes. Yeah. So David Albert was right. Yeah. It's very mysterious. And for us to pretend we know exactly how it works. Like, I don't think we have the equipment. I'm geeking out now. Go. I don't think we have the equipment, mm. this, mm. to actually get what's going on. Right. I think we're very, very limited. 100%. Because, you know, if you go into meditative states, so we talk about time, you know, mm. we're cognitively awake, we talk about time. You go into meditative states and you have the experience of no time mm. and no distance. Mm. And you're like, well, that's weird. Is that just imagination? Mm. You know, how do I know sometimes what somebody's thinking? How can I actually repeat the very thing they were thinking? Mm. How do people know when somebody dies at the moment they die? Mm. You know, um, there's all these, there's all these, these, these weird things. So I'm left with, I don't fucking know. It's incredible. I'm probably never going to know. And what the fuck do we know? And what the fuck do we know? I think I, the way I look at it sometimes is like, maybe quantum physics and neurobiology are in their infancy. Yeah. And in 200 years time, this, all of this will be within the realms of science. It won't be considered supernatural. It'll be yeah. considered natural. Yeah. There seems to be, as a human being having the human experience, some kind of a web that connects us that can't be described with our current understanding of no. mechanistic reality. No. And everybody watching will have had multiple experiences multiple. like the one you're describing. Yeah. And one day it might just be within the realms of science that goes, yeah, we know, we yeah. know where that happens now. Yeah. Our view of reality was a little bit messed up. Yeah. And now we understand, yes, we are kind of psychically connected. You know, another thing I've been thinking a lot about, I did a, I, did, I mentioned this in the podcast episode, you know, I think about people that might listen to a conversation and say, okay, that shit doesn't exist. Mm. And they, they're so ferocious in the belief. Mm -hmm. And then they say, if you think of these things, you're crazy or you're a conspiracy theorist or whatever. And then I think about, okay, so let's go look at the conspiracy theorists. Mm. They see connections that do not appear to be there. They're, some of them are just making shit up. Mm -hmm. So they're very vested in something that, that really doesn't exist. But then you look at the person that says it's all bullshit, but that's the same process. You're saying this is impossible. Uh, um, yes. You're talking about uh, Gad Saad, epistemological yeah. dichotomania. Mm. Um, both people are rigidly stuck at the dogmatic ends of both polarities. Correct. Correct. So I absolutely know that there is no conspiracy. Yeah. How, how the fuck do you know that? How do you know? I absolutely know that everything is a conspiracy. Yeah. How the fuck do you know that? Yeah. What data are you receiving? That right. make, I always... I'm irritated by people's certainty, but another part of me admires it. I'm mm. like, hmm, if I had more of that in my life, I'm sure I'd get way more done. I'd have like more grandiose visions. Yeah. It's my uncertainty yeah. that keeps me sitting back and just going, oh, I don't, yeah. I don't really know. I don't really know. When I was in groups, in different groups that turned out to be cults, mm. the certainty was incredible. You must have certainty. I knew what the truth was and right. it felt great and I felt confident. Mm. I didn't have doubt. Yeah. If there was doubt, it was buried very, very deeply yeah. in my, you know, subconscious or something. But it felt kind of like invincible, you know? It felt kind of like an armor. So, oh, this is interesting. So certainty itself feels good and therefore becomes like a kind of a drug. 
it, it's like a drug because you know, and they don't know. Oh, that's even better. You're mate. superior. Oh yeah. I love that. And you're like up your own narcissistic asshole. Oh, you know, the best place to be. The best place to be. <laughs> and, and, you know, coming out of that, um, you know, which, which we'll talk about in our course, mm. coming out of that, you know, you hit complete uncertainty yeah. and chaos. Yeah. But, you know, when you live in that bubble, like, you, you, know, you know, you meet people that are maybe very religious and they mm. really know how the world works, they think. Mm. Mm -mm. And it's rock solid. Yeah. And they have an excuse for everything. There is kind of a, and you might say, well, they're stupid. Okay. Yeah, maybe. But there's kind of a, the system is so perfect that they live in yeah. that I wonder if, like, I know for myself, I took certain risks and I would say certain things boldly mm. on camera, mm. on television, mm. that now I look back and say, that's insane. But yeah. I was so sure of myself. Yes. You know? Yeah. And then you think about, like, think about the 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 sort of malignant, narcissistic sociopaths and psychopaths that, you know, we may run into in life. Some of them are so confident. Yeah. Because their delusions are amazing. Yes. So there may be, maybe it's got legs to suggest that there's some overlap between uh, narcissistic psychopathy and absolutely rigid, rigid dogmatic certainty. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's kind of a fantastical worldview because you really can't be certain. So that's a kind of a fantasy. It's a fantasy. I, I the thing I, I don't mind when people are rigidly certain about their view of reality. Yeah. It's when they start telling people that they know how they should live. Oh yeah. Then, yeah. then I'm thinking, hey, uh, brother, you know, maybe you should just, just calm chill down out, you know? and yeah, yeah, sit, just, yeah. look at tree and relax yeah. a little. Oh, everybody must live this way. Yeah. Otherwise. Yeah. And you just think, no, oh, that's, that's neurosis, man. Yeah, it is. That's why philosophy is great because philosophy, you get to recognize different frames of reference that people yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get to go, oh, well, if this person believes this, they think this, if this, you know, you start to realize other people are different yeah. and you start to really, you know, for somebody that's very dogmatic, I mean, it's, it's a good empathy builder. Cause you're like, oh, someone is different. They, there's another you, there's another I in there. Yes. That's not me. Oh, I love talking to people like that. I've had conversations. Uh, there's two real neo-Nazis that I've known over the years. Oh, really? One, uh, they, one served in, a German, he was in, he was, he was raised in Eastern Germany and he served in a German unit that could track its lineage directly back to the Nazis. And another one was Croatian. And obviously they had, they were for a while with uh, the mm -hmm. Nazis in World mm -hmm. War II. Mm -hmm. And they still believed in the neo-Nazi ideology. I found that fascinating. I was yeah. like, tell me. I remember saying to one guy, my, my girlfriend's Chinese. Do you, do you hate me for having a Chinese girlfriend? He's like, no, no, no. I like Chinese people in China. I was like, okay. Oh, <laughs> okay. interesting. And I was like, but what if, what if I was with her and we produced children? What would happen in your world order? And he said, well, that would be a problem. You're not genetically pure anymore. And I was like, wow. And they, these were not, um, these, they're both gym uh, guys. Mm. They weren't drug users. They weren't drunk. They weren't they raging said, people. No, they were very calm. And they'd be like, this is how it should be. And the real, the, the, there's a conspir there's conspiracy theory in there. The story of Hitler that we're fed, the story of the Nazis that we're fed is not the real story. And oh. I'd be like, okay, so we we have quite a lot of footage. We have yeah. quite a lot of data. Which are the bits that you think the world is I, I wanna know. It's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. to me, okay, some of this stuff is is vile. But even if somebody has a vile ideology, I still want to explore it. If I yeah. met a black supremacist who thought all white people were devils who were there's a there's a movement where they believe white people were uh, an experiment gone wrong, like really? by some mad black professor. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, okay. there's a, there's a, if I could sit down with somebody like that, I'd love to do it just to see. Oh. Okay, how do you, how do you see the world? Because mm. maybe if I can uh, stretch my mind to your mm -hmm. the, to a worldview that's not mine, mm -hmm. I could pick up something that's useful. There's, there could be something yeah. there, even yeah. in the exercise of neuroplasticity of entering that yeah. reality and going, okay, yeah. why would you think? all white people are demonic. Where, yeah. do, where does that, where are you getting that from? Let's yeah. explore that. Yeah. What are the underpinning beliefs? Yeah. And also, as you say, like going into their, their matrix, so to speak, and mm. feeling what that must feel like. Yeah, what does yeah, it feel yeah. like? Yeah. I, I had this dream. This is really weird. Mm. I, this is way back when, and I was, you know, um, friends with Whoopi Goldberg at that point, And she was very good friends with Richard Gere, who was spending a lot of time with the Dalai Lama. And I guess I got this idea. I did this, what I thought was a past life regression. I'm not sure if it was or, you know, is mm -hmm. or 
true or not true. Mm -hmm. But in this past life regression, I am, uh, you know, a Tibetan monk and I get um, locked up in, in underground somewhere and I die, mm. you know, and I remember feeling such enormous grief about it. And I'm like, how could this happen? And Do you know that's how they kill people in Tibet? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're not allowed to actively kill you. So they'll put you underground and starve oh. you to death. Oh, That oh. was the traditional method oh, of execution centuries ago. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And here again, maybe I did know that yeah. and forgot. Maybe. And not, made it up. Not many people know that. But I, that's I don't like, even know how I know that. But that was my vision, right? <laughs> right. And again, I'm not saying this is true. Mm. And I'm walking around with this feeling of like, how could they do this? How could the, this was the Chinese that did it. Mm. Sorry, not, sorry, not, not the, 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 it was the Chinese that bit, that put me in. Okay. Apparently. Yeah. In the story. Mm. So I was thinking, how could the Chinese do this? Mm -hmm. And then I had a dream one night. And in the dream, I am a, a Chinese tank commander. Mm. And I'm like st on the turret of the tank looking, mm. looking out. And I feel such immense pride. Mm about who we are mm. and what we're doing and how good it is and all the soldiers that are under my command. And I just remember looking and seeing monks yeah, and just ordering my men to open fire. Mm. And it didn't, there was no anguish about it. There was just, this is part of cleaning up. Yeah. And I woke up so shocked and I was like, oh my God, I think I've actually, I entered the mindset, that frame, I entered the frame and it fucking makes sense. There was a Netflix series I was recommending to you and I took a screenshot of it. Mm. It's called World War II from the front lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I recommend it mm -hmm. to you as a, as a filmmaker and somebody who's interested in history and to the people watching. It's colorized, we've seen colorized stuff before, but there's a lot of lingering shots of um, people in the grip of an ideology where what you see is collective power and delight. Mm -hmm. When they're doing the, the, the shots of like the um, Stalinist military displays of power, the marches, mm -hmm. in my opinion, as somebody who's interested in psychology, these people look high. And I don't mm. think they're high on drugs. I think they're high on endorphins. Mm. They know that they are the answer to all of humanity's problems. Mm -hmm. Every single shot of the Nazis, um, it's obviously it's self shot, it's Nazi propaganda, mm -hmm. where they're walking around that they couldn't, the human face can't smile broader than that. Mm. They're so happy. The officers, the infantrymen, everybody, when mm -hmm. Hitler is near them, they're giddy. Mm -hmm. they're, these are grown men who are silly. They're like little boys. Mm -hmm. There's so much joy there mm -hmm. from this. Um, it's like a drug, the drug of yep. certainty, the drug yep. of like, we are, we re and I've always kind of imagined in my post-modern, late stage capitalist cynicism, that they were all like, oh yeah, we're the, we're the master race. Or, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. As long as I get paid, yeah. as long as I get a pretty wife at the end of this and a nice yeah. place, to, a nice yeah. cottage out in the German mountains. Yeah. yeah. I'm the no, no, yeah. they really believe. Yeah. And it's stunning to see uh, colorized human yeah. faces so yeah. lost in the ideology. Yeah, they're, they're transfixed on the vision as well. Yeah. Transfixed is the kind of word I, I, I use. Like they're seeing something nobody else can see. Right. And, and that's why it's difficult to negotiate with a person like that. Oh. Because they're not in reality at all. No, no, no. You know? And you can see, uh, back to the historical data, when you look at, like, say, example, Hitler, you look at the resources he had, you look at the money he had, you look at the number of tanks he had, the number of men he had, and I'm just looking at the map and I'm like, why, why is he invading on so many fronts? Yeah. They're high on meth. Yeah. They oh, yeah, yeah. They literally, the Germans created meth. That meth right. is a, a Nazi drug, mm. um, which people can read up about, you know, the yeah. And they kind of did the impossible. They, they really did. Yeah. And they- I'm they, not admiring it. <laughs> I am not fucking put that, admiring it. hand down. <laughs> not admiring it. We are not admiring. We are not admiring not, it. Not, not admiring. <laughs> it was a wonderful moment, very sad. And I said the impossible <clears throat> in reference to what he was saying. Well, you know, humanity has a chance and we lost it. What can we do? It's oh, all gone. God, all I gone. can just see somebody clipping that and saying, yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll be down in Argentina <laughs> and, and uh, Southern Brazil next week with our comrades. <laughs> And it's. Uh, I'm having a coughing fit about this. Well, and then and then you see um, in in this Netflix series, you see um, Bedouin doing the Hitler salute. You see um, black Africans doing the the Nazi salute. This thing gripped 
the world. It, it wasn't like Nazism wasn't German. Nazism was global. It was a brand. Um, and in terms of like branding and everything else, it was extremely modern. It was extremely forward looking. Suits by Boss. I sit here with my head shaved with my suit. I'm wearing all Hugo Boss. Are you really? Yeah. Did you know Boss? You know this, like that they designed their uniforms. Yes, 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 yes. And, and produced them. Um, the cars, even the weaponry they came up with, it's it's old now, of course, but at the yeah. time, yeah. it, it's high tech stuff. Who is the branding person? Uh, Goebbels. Goebbels is the branding person. Goebbels is your branding man. The movies they made, the way they used media. Yeah. It was Lenny on... Riefenstahl, yes. Triumph of the Will. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's um, it, obviously people had done it, but not like that. Not, not in that way at that time. And um, I've, I've looked around online and I'm seeing a lot of young people in the comments from the clips of this saying, I've never been interested in World War II or history before, but suddenly now, for some reason, I find it fascinating to go back. And I'm, I feel that. I feel this uh, zeitgeist movement to just look into our recent past, World War II, World War I, and be like, what was the mass hysteria that led to so much violence, right. to, so, to so much horror in the end, so much atrocity? Right. And how, how did these men, who we must presume in all due humility, they have the same brains we do. They're as evolved as we are. They're largely raised on the same diet and life hasn't changed that much. How could they do what they did and smile mm -hmm. and laugh and be like, mm -hmm. yes, this is, this is great. It's this grand vision where they really literally, not cynically, not yeah. ironically yeah. in their hearts believed we will save the human race. Yeah. And people are far more programmable than, than, than I think the general populace realizes. Because they're suffering from this um, this thing that I am. Obviously, I'm, I'm 45, but I work a lot online. And so I'm consuming a lot of online content. So I would claim that any of us who are exposed to a lot of like Instagram memes and TikTok culture, we end up with like a millennial Gen Z mindset, even mm. if we're not. And I have this uh, hipstery postmodern cynicism, like, yeah, you know, it's so dumb. We're so woke now, we'd never do that again. And in the last couple of years, I've been like, no, we're, we're doing it again. Mm -hmm. the, the, I can hear the war drums. They're quiet mm -hmm. now, but mm -hmm. they're raising in pitch and volume. It's not that long until people jump into the uniforms and go, we have the solution. We have the big solution mm -hmm. all over again. We yeah. just have to get rid of, I don't know, pick someone. It's yeah. Nietzsche's ressentiment all over again. Just pick the group. Yeah. Let's go to war. In the course that people can watch with you and I, um, I talk a lot about my cult experience. What led you into cult? Well, go on. Let me, let me tell you this thing. Go I'll ahead, go back. Go ahead. <clears throat> Keith Ranieri, the cult leader, mm. came up with the idea of having the second in command, Nancy Salzman, record videos of herself mm. and play them for the class. So most of the classes were, were her on, on, on a television set mm -hmm. and then a trainer. Mm. And he, the reason he said that we should do that, well, that they should do that, it was before my time, was because he said there's something that happens psychologically when you look at somebody in a television set. Mm -hmm. It elevates them. Mm. And I was like, that's interesting because we got television in South Africa very late. I think 1976, we got television. You're joking. No, late, very late. You didn't have television no. until 1976? No. Oh, I'm sure there's there must be anthropologists and sociologists no. who've written about that. That's... And, and then when we did have it, um, it was a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. I think it was at first, it was like three hours. And so my grandfather, who was an advertising executive, mm -hmm. I remember the night we sat and we, we, we waited for the very first broadcast mm -hmm. because he wanted to see if one of the commercials he had made would be on. Mm -hmm. But I remember the news anchors coming on and they felt like gods, mm -hmm. you know? And there was, and it was so cute now that I look back at it, that we looked at these people like they were speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. Later, when I um, was a news cameraman, <clears throat> you know, I had the experience of going to shoot something, seeing what happened. And then that night on television, watching my footage and the story the anchors told about the footage was an absolute lie. Really? And I was like, motherfuckers. You gave, That's not what happened. You gave them the footage and they put in a different spin. Yeah, they basically said, these people attacked these people. Well, what actually happened is the cops attacked them. Right. They, bl they blamed a rival faction. And I was like, 
Jesus. And that was really for me, <clears throat> the moment I understood, like, you guys are not doing truth. You're just serving whatever agenda. Now, at that time, what, we, what I understood later was that the South African intelligence and the news were the same. Right. Now, the thing people don't realize is they think, well, that's all changed now. Now we have real journalism. Mm -hmm. I can promise you it's the same. <laughs> I can promise you, yeah. no matter which country you live in, mm. it is exactly the same. You're not hearing the truth, but what happens is you're watching somebody in that glamorous box mm. dressed very well. Mm. They have a very clear script and you think, you think you're getting the truth. So under those circumstances, you believe whatever they say. Mm. They tell you who to hate. Yeah. They tell you who to approve of. I just did a podcast about this. It's called uh, A Soldier Story, I think. What is the name of your podcast? The name of my podcast is What the Fuck is on My Mind, shortened to WTF is on my mind. WTF is on my mind. Yeah, and it's basically whatever I'm thinking about, you know, in any given week or month, you know. I highly recommend it. Give it a go. Um, it seems like we're living in a blend of 1984 and Brave New World. Yeah, and, and the thing that's weird is that because people aren't reading enough history at the moment, they think they've figured everything out. Mm. They, they're going to do it differently than everybody else. Mm. And I'm looking at what's happening right now in the Western world, mm. I'd say especially in the Five Eyes countries. Um, for people who don't know what the Five Eyes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an agreement between the intelligence agencies of uh, Canada, the United States, the UK, Australia, one other country, I can't remember, where... You can't spy on your own citizens, but you can spy on each other's citizens. Mm -hmm. they, they share information. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm seeing is the same kind of stuff that happened in South Africa. Mm. So for me, it's still very fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, for some people, it may have been a long time ago, but for me, the 80s in South Africa, the 70s and the 80s, and the control that the government had um, and the intelligence agencies had, I'm seeing some of the same stuff now. Yeah. But there's a weird thing going on where people are like, no. That can't be. Our leaders love us. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. They're thinking about us. All their decisions are about us. And the reason they make millions upon millions of dollars of deals and things is because they're thinking of us. Mm. It's cute. It is cute. It's bullshit, but it's cute. No, we're, we're effectively slaves living on a, a nicer plantation. Yes. And we're being harvested for our tax. That's it. Yes. That's all we are. Ah, you conspiracy theorist, you. You dirty, dirty <clears throat> conspiracy theorist. My father was also uh, not in intelligence, but he was attached to intelligence uh, when he was in the RAF. He did some some checking on, he, he was taught Russian, uh, hot housed. They took these RAF guys and hot housed them in Russian in three months. Mm. And then they would listen to uh, Russian dialogue and analyze Russian dialogue that they picked up on radio yeah. chatter and yeah. pilots talking to each other, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and he <laughs> had a very, very, he didn't consider himself a conspiracy theorist at all, but very mm. conspiratorial worldview. He was like, the news is not, is not the news. Mm -hmm. You've no idea what, what you're being told. <laughs> Just assume the whole thing is, is pure propaganda. Yeah. It's pure yeah. ideology and propaganda. There's nothing yeah. else. My dad told me the same thing. Because I'd come back from something and say, oh, this is in the news. And he'd go, yeah, that's not what's going on. You have described yourself as a cult hopper. Yeah, yeah. So let me pick up to when you said, why did you join, join a cult? Yeah. Well, first of all, you don't join a cult. Yeah, nobody's like, nobody oh, joins a cult. cult. Let's join. <laughs> <laughs> you never join a cult. You, you join something. And, and in, in this um, HBO series that I'm in called The Vow, at one point I have a whole monologue where I yell about it and I say, nobody joins a vow, they join a good thing. Nobody joins, nobody joins a cult. Nobody joins a cult. The vow is not a cult. <laughs> nobody joins a cult. They join a good thing. And what I meant was you join something you think is good. Yeah. And so for me, you know, after I made What the Bleep, it became very big. You know, um, I was traveling all around the world, you know, with, with, with my other producers. And this group of people, and this happened a, a few times, a number of people reached out and said, we want to talk to you. You know, we want you to make a movie about our particular philosophy or whatever. And I got an, a, a letter from, from somebody um, who said, we saw your film, we love your film, we want to invite you to a symposium with a number of scientists. And it was mm -hmm. people like Fritjof Capra and a bunch of like really cool people. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up meeting with, it was two ladies, ended up meeting with them. And they were very smart. Mm -hmm. Like 
One of them was a, a master NLP trainer, which I didn't know what that was at that point. And basically they said to me, everything you're talking about in your movie, we know how to do it. Mm. I was like, yeah, whatever. And then um, they said, well, why don't you just come and take one of our courses? And I said, I'm just very busy and blah, blah, blah. And okay, find five days, you know? And so it was a business school. Mm. It was called Executive Success Programs. And so eventually I, I decide, okay, I have a little window here, you know? Um, but what happens before that to really seal a deal is they've said to me, you know, we can help you make your movies, yada, yada, yada. So one day I get a call, this is before my training, I get a call to say, um, we, we want to fly into town to see you. At this point, I'm living in, in Oregon, in Ashland, Oregon. We want to fly into town. Would you be willing to introduce us to some of the scientists in your film? We'd like to talk to them. Mm. And I go, sure, I'm okay with that. So the day comes and um, I'm about to head to the airport and I go, you know, which, you know, which airline? They go, oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's the, the little airport, the other one. And I'm like, huh, go to the other airport. And this Learjet lands. And I get picked up in a Learjet. And now for a week, they're flying me all over the country in a very, very expensive Learjet mm. that's owned by one of the people in this group. Mm. Um, in fact, there's two women on, on, on the plane. One of them owns the plane. Mm. And it's, you know, whining and dining and whatever and meeting the scientists. And it's kind of like for me who just love science and love science. It was amazing, mm. you know? And then they said, you know, we think we can help you make some of the movies. Now I'm flying in a very expensive Learjet being promised, you know, that we can probably help you do these things. And I'm like, this is amazing. Like I have hit the jackpot. Mm. So I eventually go and do the training mm. and it's like a bunch of NLP stuff and maybe some Scientology stuff and a bunch of, it's, 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 to me, it seems very advanced and they, they're able to fix something that I struggle with very quickly. Mm. And I'm like, okay, these people have got their shit figured out. Now I joined a business program. Mm. 12 years later, I realize it's a fucking cult. And the leader is a fucking sociopath mm. and he's doing horrible things to people. You know, so what you, what the on-ramp is you join something that's awesome. Mm. And the off-ramp is holy shit, what just happened? For people who don't know, or if they haven't seen The Vow, uh, the leader, Keith Raniere, uh, what sentence was he eventually given? So he was given 120 years. And he's currently somewhere in Arizona in a maximum security prison. And his crimes that he was convicted of? It was things like uh, sex trafficking, conspiracy to sex trafficking, wire fraud. Um, it was a bunch of other things. I can't even remember all of them. It was seven charges. And you were working with the FBI yeah. for a while to get yeah. him put away. Yeah, I was actually hammering on their door um, a number of agencies, not only the FBI, DEA, FBI, police in several countries, um, trying to get this man um, prosecuted. Mm. And I even had, with a bunch of people, we figured out what the case is. You know, it was a, it was a racketeering case, but we couldn't get anywhere because yeah. nobody was listening to us. Or the people that were listening were like, it's just too much to take on. It's too big. It's too expensive to take it on. So we went to the New York Times mm. and we um, spoke to New York Times journalists and a lot of us went on the record and once that came out, that was October, 2017. Once that came out shortly after that, another division of the FBI reached out and started talking to us. And that's when the case began. That other division uh, already had experience with, with cults and groups. I don't know if they did, but I do know that they'd had experience because you know, the FBI has experience with, with, with like mafia type organizations. Okay. And in essence, what this was, was that. Okay. It was just wearing the cloak of personal development. Yeah. You know, but they did the same kinds of, they weren't explicitly killing people. Um, but you know, if, if you stepped out of line, they went after you using legal means, yeah. um, spying on you, you know. They would, hire, they would hire private investigators. A lot of the time. Yeah. A lot of the time, yeah. Trying to dig for dirt. Yeah, yeah. So if we go to the course, we discuss a lot of this in the course. That's true. Uh, the course that we have just spent three days shooting here in lovely Liverpool, um, where we looked, we wanted to explore the overlap between narcissistic abuse and cult abuse and the recovery from narcissistic abuse and cult abuse. Um, turns out there's quite a bit of overlap. A lot. Yeah. A lot. Almost, I would say, cult abuse is narcissistic abuse writ large. Pretty much. It's sort of like um, narcissistic abuse in a family. It's just the family has a lot of siblings and children. Yeah. Yeah. 
So when we were doing the course, um, there was a couple of light bulb moments for me where I could really see uh, the overlap. Uh, as you just described being flown around in a Learjet and people telling you that, listen, uh, we, we recognize you, we see you, um, you really have a gift and we're gonna help, we're gonna fund your movies. Uh, that would be what I would call the bait yeah. and the covert contract that yeah. people get in romantic <laughs> narcissistic abusive relationships. There isn't a filmmaker alive who would refuse that temptation, right? We filmmakers are, are, are hungry, not for money. Mm. We're hungry to make our art. Yeah. And so if somebody comes along and says, I will help you do that. Yeah. And you don't think they're a complete scoundrel. Mm. You're like, I'm in. You're going to do it. And the thing is, <clears throat> when you meet nice people, mm. you know, they're not scoundrels. Yeah. Much later you realize, oh, that's not true. Yes. That's not true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but, but. Every filmmaker is just, is, is so desperate. I mean, maybe every artist, I'm not sure. Mm. They're desperate to get, get it out, mm. you know? And yeah, maybe some think, oh, because then I'll have love and attention. But like for some of us, it's just, I want to get, there's something in me. I need to get it out and you need help to do it. Filmmaking is collaborative. It's not, you know, it's not the auteur, yeah. you know, my own thing. I think for some filmmakers, it is narcissistic and mm -hmm. it, it's what, it's what it will get them that they're craving, but they usually make shitty films. Yeah. Um, yeah. For real creatives, uh, it reminds me of a biblical quote to Mark. Mm. And they didn't make the official Bible. It's from uh, the Gospel of Thomas. It's a mm. Gnostic Gospel in which Jesus says, if what is within you is brought forth from you, what is within you will save you. Mm. If what is within you is not brought forth from you, what is within you will destroy you. Hmm. And I think for true creatives, it's like you have something in you that must come out. It's a, it's, it's a, it's an imperative. It's like a survival imperative. Yeah. It's not, but it feels like it. If it. Well, yes, it's extremely somatically uncomfortable yeah. to not express the thing that's yeah. inside of you. That's the thing I think about. I think about if I die and I don't get some of these things out, mm. it would feel terrible. Yeah. 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 So you have this mission to, to get this stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of films, can you name me some of your favorite films? Obviously Star Wars, mm. um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm -hmm. um, Blade Runner, mm -hmm. Alien. And then there's funny little films like Princess Bride. Oh yeah. I love Princess Bride. That's a good movie. I love it. I'm trying to think of the other, the other movies I love, like I love The Abyss. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I do also honestly love some of in, in, in recent times, I, I love, I love Gladiator. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a filmmaker named Alex Garland who made Ex, Ex Machina. And he did uh, The Beach as well. He did, did you? Yeah, he did The Beach, yeah. yeah. And he's actually got a new movie coming out called Civil War. Mm -hmm. I do, his stuff is very heady, mm. but I find it so interesting. Mm -hmm. My other favorite filmmaker is, uh, who's now gone is Terrence Malick. Terrence Malick made Days of Heaven. So um, I'm so sorry. No, sorry. Terrence Malick is not gone. I'm sorry. He's alive. What am I saying? I have to know whether it's, I might have, it might actually be Danny Boyle on the beach. Sorry, it was Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Terrence Malick made uh, a movie called Badlands and he made uh, Days of Heaven. Mm. Sorry. I made a mistake. Nestrel Mendros, the, the direct photography, he's the one that, that died. Um, mm. Terrence Malick is still going. Terrence Malick also made a film called Night of Cups, which is a bizarre film. I've never heard of that. It's very odd. And, and what he does, I think it's very frustrating for the actors because like they have a script and they throw it all out. Mm -hmm. And it feels a bit like you know, when, you're, when you're making a film, the camera rolls, mm -hmm. you know, people are fidgeting and getting stuff ready. The board comes in, the clapper goes in, there's a pause, everybody settles, and then the director yells action. Mm -hmm. And then when you're at the end of the, the thing, the director yells cut and the camera doesn't cut immediately necessarily. There's a few few frames. It feels like he makes these movies with the beginning and the end. Right. And not the middle. So yeah. it's weird. But the thing about his movies, his style, is it's how we dream. Mm. It's bits and pieces of stuff. So there's no narrative to really hold on to, mm -hmm. but you're swimming in the in the unconscious. Mm. You know, I don't know that I could make a sustained film like that but I like doing little bits of that here and there when right. I make stuff, you know, to, to sort of shift you 
into a different state, mm. into sort of a more dreamlike state mm. so that you can maybe process what you just heard or what you just saw. You know, I think is, uh, is good at that, but in a nasty way is uh, Aronofsky. Yeah. And yeah. he really, I've always said, I watch his movies and I'm like, I think he fucking hates me. I think he hates the audience. It's yeah, such, he might, right? It's such a trauma. Yeah. But he can replicate um, the sensation of hysterical pathology and psychosis mm-hmm. so well on film. Yeah. That it's, <laughs> you know, yeah. I've, I've paused, I have to pause the films and walk away and like, yeah. Okay, yeah. let's go. Let's let's try yeah. again. It's yeah. tough, but he has that ability. Um, the reason I mention him is that the dreamlike part. Yeah, that, you know, you're in reality, but yeah. it's like a a, a drug induced fever dream that you just want yeah. to end. Yeah. It's awful. You just want it yeah. to stop. Yeah, and when it stops, it's catastrophe. Yeah, it's true, right? The other thing, obviously, I love. You know, I love a lot of Spielberg's films. Spielberg's films are generally very organized. Mm. Uh, for me, sometimes too organized mm-hmm. uh, because I can feel the construction of the scene. Yeah. Like I can feel the camera. I, I, I'm aware of the camera moving. Yes. Personally, I feel like all of that should disappear. Yeah. You know, um, a well-made film, hopefully you don't even notice that's the hope. You don't even notice. You don't even know you're watching a movie. You suspend all disbelief and you're thoroughly in that world. Mm. You don't know there's a crew there. You don't know any of that's there, you know? So with Spielberg, uh, I, I'd had the same thing. Like, I'm like, this is good filmmaking. Yeah. I am enjoying the way this film has been made so well. Yes. <laughs> but I'm not yes. like uh, the Blade Runner moments. Like no. I'm there with yeah. Deckard, wherever he's like yeah. buying from a, a food yeah. stand and yeah. he's talking to me. I'm there yeah. with, with Spielberg. Even even the beautiful stuff he did with Saving Private Ryan, like the Amazing. first few scenes. Amazing. You're full of admiration. Yeah. I'm not sure that I'm, I, I, I know what you're talking it's about. It's a little bit theatrical. Yes. Again, look, I want to say one thing though, because everybody criticizes movies and yeah. they need to understand the fact that any film gets made is a fucking miracle. Yes. So people can like pull shit apart. Yes. But like really the amount of fucking drama and politics yeah. that's happening. Yeah. The fact that it gets made. Yeah. Good for you. I just watched well Mel, done. I just watched Mel Gibson talking about this on a round table last night. Mm. And he's he's like, it, it's, it, it, this should never happen. When you when he said if you if you're there on set and you know the the budget and the time frame we have, he was talking specifically about Hacksaw Ridge mm. and comparing it to he said he had half the time and half the budget that he did for Braveheart. Yeah. And it's 20 years later. Yeah. And he said, there's no way that should have been made. And not only was it finished, it's a good movie. Yeah. Um, but he said, it's, it's, it's chaos and people don't know no. the amount of strain yeah. and the like, grit that it takes to yeah. actually get the no, thing finished. No, making a movie, you know, because what happens is, <clears throat> you know, you have a 90 page or 100 page script, right? And you have um, producer and line producer go through it and say, okay, looks like it's going to take you this many days. And you say, you want me to shoot five pages a day? Now, five pages a day doesn't sound to somebody if you're, it doesn't sound like a lot if you're like doing a podcast. Yeah. But five pages a day, depending on how you shoot, could you could just shoot one shot yeah. that's five minutes long and everybody's falling asleep. Yeah. Or you can shoot 70 shots and everybody's there and staying awake. But now you have to shoot 70 shots in one day. With multiple takes, presumably. With multiple takes. And every time you move the camera, mm. like we're in a situation right now where it's lit in such a way that every direction is going to kind of work. Yeah. And there are compromises. Like we could light this way better, Yeah, you know, if we're doing a single shot at a time. Yeah. Every time you move the camera, there's a whole bunch of shit that has to happen. Mm. You know, we talk about on set, let's turn around. And turn mm. around is like, fuck. Mm. It's like, you've shot everything this way. Yeah. Now you got to shoot that way. Right. Now all the shit that's over there has to move over there. Yes. And that's like 20 big fucking trucks and blah, 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 and whatever. And, and all the lighting is humans and, and, and yeah. oh, just and trailers and whatever, you know? And it's like, <laughs> it's a laborious process, which is why sometimes directors, we go like, God, I wish I could just, just be me and the camera, hmm. which, which is fun, but you don't get, you know, you, you don't get much of a film, but it, it's, it's an incredible process. It's like, and everybody, know, the good thing, everybody knows their job really well. Mm. You have a good crew mm. and it's, there's military precision mm-hmm. and it's changing as well. Like I, I went on the set of, uh, I can talk about this, right? Cause there's stuff out now. So mm. Obi-Wan Kenobi, there's the making of Obi-Wan, which is on Disney, which is kind of mm. cool to watch. Um, everybody's not everybody. A lot of sci-fi people are now using what are called um, uh, virtual backgrounds. Mm. And it's a different way of filmmaking. Mm. 
And basically what it means is everything behind us, if you look at the two shot, everything behind us would actually be LED screens. Right. And the camera's back here. And so you're actually projecting the environment back there. And it's mm. a very cool process. Mm. Um, it's called the volume. Okay. The stage, it's massive. Mm. It's millions of dollars of, of LED screens. And mm. it's a different way of filmmaking. Um, and in some ways it's making things move faster, mm. but if it's not executed well, it looks like shit. And you're like, that's, that's, that's the volume. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but if you look at like, um, you know, a lot of the new Star Wars things like uh, Ahsoka, Obi-Wan, um, a lot of the Star Wars series mm. uh, and a lot of the Marvel movies now, that's all, that's all volume. That's not really, none of that's really there. I find, um, or I, sorry, I didn't realize this was happening, um, but across time, over the last 10 years, uh, I, I started to report after a movie to my friends. I felt a bit numb. Mm. And I thought it was that I was just getting overstimulated and I just had enough of watching giant robot monsters tear Manhattan apart. Mm. And I think actually it's also the special effects has, has it, it changed. It might be. And also what happens, you know, it's rough for an actor. Like if you're shooting on big blue screens, you know, mm. and basically for people to understand, you know, if we're sitting here and, and there'd be a blue screen or a green screen behind us, mm. Um, and there's like, you know, dinosaurs back there mm. charging towards us. Mm. As an actor, you're looking at an X and somebody's yelling, the dinosaur is 20 meters away, 15, 10, you're fucked. <laughs> and you know, it's an X, <laughs> you know, look at an X yeah. and you can say, yeah, but that's what actors are paid for their imagination. Yeah, but it's hard. Yeah, we should also and help them a little it's bit. It's hard. I mean, you're, you're, and, 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 you know, like, like, like my wife, Bonnie was saying that when they did the um, Attack of the Clones or whatever thing mm. she was in, I forgot. It's mm. terrible. I forgot. Star Wars people are going to be like, my God, how can you forget? She said like, you're living on a, on a blue screen. So most of that is done. It's, 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 it's like not fun. Yeah. Like, the people are there. Yeah. But like, it's all just blue. Yes. And, and somebody's saying to you, that's what's going on out there. There's a, a Death Star and like a bunch of shuttles and shit and stormtroopers, but you're like, yeah. 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 No, I, 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 I hear you. I think um, I had a conversation here uh, six months ago with uh, a quite a famous film critic from Liverpool. And uh, we, were, we were having this kind of conversation and he spoke about Spielberg and said, you know, people mock Spielberg because it's kind of hokey sometimes. Mm -hmm, a little like mm -hmm. American folksy stuff gets in there. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't watch him anymore. And he said, did you see AI? Mm. And I went, no, I'm not watching that. Mm. Some stupid story about a little boy who's going to come to mm. life as an adult. He said, no, that's so good. not what AI is. Yeah. He said, that's a Stanley Kubrick movie yeah. that Stanley gave to Spielberg. Yeah. Watch it. Yeah. I was horror. I was like, is this Spielberg? Yeah. It's like ch child uh, 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 sex robots for yeah. pedophiles. Yeah, it, was that. Weird. it was weird. I, I watched it and I was like, I, I don't know whether I even thought it was a good movie. I yeah. couldn't take my eyes yeah. off the screen. And I finished it and I was like, I, 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 don't, know what, I don't know what to no, feel. I don't know I what remember to think. It, it's it's, you're kind of entranced, you're like. Yeah. You know, Spielberg, yeah. Uh, sorry, um, Kubrick, another, another filmmaker. I mean, Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah. My God. Yeah. 2001. I, all, all film people still watch 2001 and we sit there in awe. I, uh, when I was younger, I tried it and I was like, oh, this is boring. I went back to it as an adult. And I was like, this is, uh, I think with, with Stanley uh, Kubrick, um, he respects the audience's intelligence. He's not spoon feed. He's not Correct. like, oh, you're, you're just a bunch yeah. of American idiots here who just want to see Bang Bang go fly in yeah. the air. Yeah. He's like, no, here's the space yes. for you to think. Yes. And we're lingering on this shot yeah. so that you can actually enjoy this moment. Exactly. Which is... It's so much more it's trust. refreshing. Yeah. yeah. You know, there, there, are some, there are some stupid people that make some stupid decisions in Hollywood. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me just fucking say it. Do you remember when Gladiator first came out? I don't know what the ads were like in mm. the UK, mm. but in America, mm. they thought, let's show a, f a, f a football players hitting each other for people to understand what gladiators are. Really? Yeah. That was the first ad. And I'm like, are you fucking joking? <laughs> I fucking know what a gladiator is. Hello, America. This is a gladiator, much like football, but with swords. And I was like, who is the <laughs> idiot that said, oh, they're too dumb? And that's the problem. You know, you gotta, you gotta like, you gotta, if, if, if you think your audience is out of reach, fine, let them reach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They like efforts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you like watching the thing where you're like, what's going on? People loved Lost. Yes. Because they're like, 
what the fuck is going on? It's a shame that they had no payoff. Oh my god! They only I'm still... had mystery. They only had mystery and and no and no payoff. No, I think I think what happened, and this this does happen, by the way. You know, yeah. you get you get greenlit for season one, two, three. Yes. At a certain point, you know, you have three more seasons. Yeah. And the studio's like, fuck it, no, this is it. You're like, how am I going to wrap this up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's put them in a church. It was all an imagination. Oh my <laughs> god! You know, you assholes. But I know why it happened. Yeah. Do, do you think it started as, as being commissioned for one season? People loved it and they went, oh no, we're going to give you more money. No, when, and you, pitch, when you pitch it, it you usually, you pitch, you pitch a pilot mm. and you usually have what we call a show Bible mm -hmm. and it's multiple seasons. Right. Like I have one that's got seven seasons, mm -hmm. you know, um, still working on trying to get it made, but like I have a pilot and I have the first season laid out very well. Mm. And then I have like, you know, um, a general outline of the other six seasons. So okay. you hope for more. You hope for more. Yeah. You hope for more. So as far as uh, recovery from uh, the cults go, do you feel like you've recovered? A lot. Yeah. A lot. Just so that yeah. people, I'd, like, if people are recovering from cult abuse or narcissistic abuse, there is there is hope. There, there is, is hope, yeah. Know. I mean, look, I'm six, I'm six years out. Mm. Um, the first few years were hell. Mm. Um, I think, you know, we, we go through some of them in the course. I think we get into great detail, yep. but there is hope, yep. you know, getting out of a relationship or a family or, a, you know, corporation or a church or a cult or a, a political cult. Mm. There is, there is hope there. Are, there is actually a pathway out. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought at first when I, when I first realized, holy shit, I've been in a cult. I didn't know that there was a, a path mm. out until I started reading the books about it. And so I started watching the movies about it. I was like, oh, there's a way out. Mm. Just like you don't know that the narcissist has a playbook. Yeah. You don't know at first that there's also a playbook for, for exit. Mm -hmm. There are people that know how to help you get out. Yes. And when I say get out, yes, get out of the cult, but also get out of the, the mind trap because it's a mind trap mm -hmm. that you've been stuck in. Where can people uh, find you, Mark, if they want to follow you? I'm most active on Instagram, so Mark Vicente. Mm -hmm. um, I have a website, uh, markvicente.com. Mm -hmm. I am also, you know, on Facebook and X and, you know, TikTok, I play around a little bit, but mostly just go to my website or Instagram. That's that's where I am. Wonderful. And the other thing yes, sir. that people sh should look forward to is, this is now 2023, the end of 2023. Next year, 2024, a film called Empathy Not Included will be coming out about narcissism, narcissistic abuse, it's going to be fascinating. Excellent. Excellent. Mark, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks, man. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. Uh, thank you for your time and for your attention. And I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Cheers.